Good evening. I'll call this meeting of the Housing Authority of the City of Salem for March 22nd, 2021 to order. If the recorder will please call the roll. Vice Chair Stapleton. Here. Commissioner Anderson. Present. Commissioner Phillips. Here. Commissioner Leung. Absent. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Chair Hoy. Here. Commissioner Nordyke. Here. Commissioner Lewis. Here. Thank you. Thank you. And if you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stapleton, the consent count. I'm sorry, we have nobody signed up for uh, public comment. And Commissioner Stapleton, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? We do not. Thank you. Got those re reversed, but, and uh, Commissioner Stapleton, the consent calendar. Yeah, I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Thank you. Moved by Commissioner Stapleton, seconded by Commissioner Phillips. Commissioner Stapleton. Yes, the consent calendar consists of item 3.1A, which are the March 8th, 2021 draft Salem Housing Authority minutes. Item number 3.3A, Authority submittal of an application and acceptance of funding if awarded for up to 100,000 through the City of Salem Home Investment Partnership Program to develop the Sequoia Crossing Affordable Housing. Item 3.3B, amendments to the Salem Housing Authority's 2020-21 Public Housing Authority Plan and Annual Capital Fund Plan. And that concludes the consent calendar. Thank you, is there any discussion? If the recorder will uh, call the, for the vote. Commissioner Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Phillips. Aye. Commissioner Leung, absent. Commissioner Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Nordyke. Aye. Commissioner Lewis. Aye. Vice Chair Stapleton. Aye. Chair Hoy. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, the motion passes. Uh, we have no public hearings. We have no special orders of business, but we do have an information report. And I see uh, Ms. Utes has joined us. Would you like to share with us some highlights from your uh, report, please? Sure, good evening. I'm Nicole Utes. I'm the Housing Administrator for Salem Housing Authority. Uh, I just wanted to take note that we did put a, a quick blurb on this new Sequoia Crossings Affordable Housing Project, which is our main focus at the moment to try to bring 60 more beautiful units of affordable housing, permanent supportive housing here to Salem. Um, that application I can officially tell you is submitted as of tonight for the first round of permanent supportive housing funds. So we are very hopeful, we're very excited. And hopefully you can see a quick blurb of the rendering and how um, much effort and work has gone into the architectural design to make that um, really capture all of the essence that we learned through the Permanent Supportive Housing Institute and put that um, to paper. So we, we have hired a CMGC, we have the architect in, we have the grants ready to go, and we're excited to hopefully bring another project to Salem. Um, beyond that, we do have some more exciting news that we were awarded the ESG uh, COC grants that came through the, the um, Continuum of Care Collaborative. So. We will be bringing on a few new housing navigators, three to be exact, and it'll also provide them computers and some software and programs to be able to get out there in the field and camps and help navigate into uh, individuals into some permanent stability and, and housing. Um, on top of that, the HRAP program continues to be successful. We're staying at right at 86%, and which is above the national average. Um, even though it's been a very difficult time in trying to secure more landlords, we're still making progress. Excellent. I just wanted to con congratulate you and your staff on the uh, excellent work so far on the Sequoia Crossings. The rendering is, is stunning, and I think that'll be a really wonderful place for people to live uh, if we're successful with all of that, and I really appreciate your hard work. And I, I want to follow up on one of your comments regarding the grant that we were successfully, we successfully uh, received or I've been notified that we're going to be receiving it. I was going to comment on, on it during councilor comments at city council, but uh, the Wind of Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance, with, where I'm your uh, representative, I'm the vice chair of that group, applied through a, for a collaborative grant 
a few months ago, and we have been notified that the, the um, Oregon Housing and Community Services intends to award us $5.5 million to help address homelessness in this region. It's not just in the city of Salem. It's a number of our neighboring communities. We worked in a, it's a really broad partnership of groups and uh, organizations that came together to submit this application. And I'm very excited about it. It's really going to be a game changer. I can't wait to share the details soon. Uh, Commissioner Nordyk. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that. What kind, I know that a lot of grants have a lot of strings attached. What kinds of things would this fund? Would it be like buying land? Would it be uh, rental vouchers? Would it be case management services? Any or all of the above? I'm just curious what that might entail. So there's going to be a, a detailed press release coming out soon. And I don't have our, our fact sheet right in front of me, but it, it's basically all of those things. There's uh, there's a, a hotel voucher program, there's a case management, there's um, uh, rapid rehousing, uh, there's a lot of different elements to it for, through a lot of different areas, and there'll be a lot of details coming out really soon. That's awesome. Yeah. Any other uh, questions or comments for Ms. Utes? Well, keep up the great work. I know you have been burning the candle at both ends, literally, and I really, really appreciate it. It doesn't uh, not everybody notices uh, uh, your work because it's kind of behind the scenes, but I want you to know I notice it and I appreciate you and your staff very much. So, thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. And with that, I don't see any more business before the Housing Authority for the City of Salem. So we are adjourned. call this meeting of the Salem City Council for Monday, March 22nd to order. Uh, if you have problems hearing me, wave at me because I'll, I'll try to speak up. Uh, we're, uh, we had an IT person in today to help us out with this and apparently it worked. As long as the IT person was here, it worked fine. <laughs> so we're, we're working on an alternative. Uh, the city manager apparently is an expert in this and he's Uh, now, if uh, the recorder would please call the roll. Councilor Stapleton. I'm here. Councilor Anderson. So am I. Councilor Phillips. Here. Councilor Leung. Absent. Councilor Gonzalez. Here. Councilor Hoy. Here. Councilor Nordyke. Here. Councilor Lewis. Here. Mayor Bennett. Here. Thank you. Do we have any additions or deletions, Councillor? Yes, I move approval of additions and deletions to the agenda. Second. Second by Anderson. That's item 3.3D, the priority bills for the uh, 2021 legislative session. And item 5A, amending the emergency declaration related to unsheltered residents to allow for a limited managed outdoor camp at city owned property at 2640 Portland Road Northeast. Good. We'll need to vote on that, sir. I know, and I'm just making myself a note here. Gotcha. Okay, uh, the recorder, please call the roll. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Councillor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Young? Absent? Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor, or Mayor Bennett? Aye. Thank you. Uh, now's an opportunity for the council. Mm -hmm. Councillor, to have a comment. Uh, just one second on this. Uh, Courtney, I, I had understood that Councillor Leung might have a statement this evening she'd like to present at this time. Do you know if she's going to be here? Councillor Leung? Councilor Liang has not yet joined the meeting. Would you give her a call and see if she wants to? Would that be okay? Sure, I'll try. Thank you. Because yeah, we're going to go by her spot here. Okay. Now, Councillor Nordyke. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So a few things I want to comment on tonight. Uh, first of all, I know on our agenda this evening is a proclamation concerning Child Abuse Prevention Month. As someone who has handled child abuse cases for about six years as the Oregon Department of Justice, I've kept a lot of child molesters behind bars. And I can tell you that child abuse is real and much more prevalent than many of us realize. So I look forward to the proclamation and I wanna thank the mayor for accepting and providing that proclamation tonight. There are plenty of ways to educate yourself about how to prevent child abuse. And I recommend reaching out to our local child abuse assessment center, the Liberty House for more information. Counselor Stapleton and I recently participated in one of their free trainings that they put on, which is all available by Zoom, of course. And so it's a great training for anyone who works with children, interacts with children, teachers, coaches, mentors, you name it. There are a lot of folks who I think would benefit from that training. And I thought it was fantastic. And as I said, it's available free of charge from the Liberty House. So I recommend that. Moving on, I want to uh, express solidarity with our Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Unfortunately, we keep hearing over and over again about threats, about hate crimes and violence perpetuated <clears throat> against members of the community around the country. And as Dr. Keene said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I consider attack on any member of the community when, when it's on gender or color of skin or some other immutable characteristic to really be an attack on all of us. But condemnation of hate is not enough. And I recommend folks, if you, are, if you see bias, we have at the Oregon Department of Justice a bias response hotline. That phone number is 1-844-924-2427. The bias response hotline is provided by DOJ and it connects people with trauma-informed hotline advocates who are trained in crisis intervention and can provide bias response advocacy, including assistance in reporting a bias crime to law enforcement. The hotline advocate will inquire if you would like or need an interpreter. They have access to interpreters in over 240 languages via a program called Language Link. Unfortunately, calls to the bias hotline are up. Last year, 2020, we had 1,099 calls, which averages to about 91 calls a month. But here we are just about two months into 2021. Well, we're now into March, but they now have tallied the reports of bias for the first two months of the year 2021, and that is 249 reports, which comes to a monthly average of about 124 calls. This is a disturbing pattern that seems to be on the rise across the nation, but please avail yourself of the bias hotline. Also earlier tonight in our capacity on the Salem Housing Authority, we voted to authorize submittal of an application uh, to further our support for our Sequoia Crossings program. I'm very excited about this. I know the rest of the council is too. So I congratulate uh, Nicole Utes and her entire team on continuing to move the ball forward. This is gonna be a real game changer in affordable housing for some of the most vulnerable people among us. Uh, while we're on the lines of affordable housing, I met recently with the United Way leadership team and Councillor Hoy to discuss tiny home options. More to come on that, but that is in pursuit of tiny home options for low income seniors. We all know seniors who are on a fixed income. So having affordable housing for that vulnerable population is crucial. And last but not least, I recently toured the Rotary Amphitheater with Councillor Stapleton. I really feel that this Rotary, Amp Rotary Amphitheater is gonna be a real game changer for downtown and for Salem in general. It's literally gonna put us on the map for performing, performing arts that are touring throughout the Pacific Northwest. We all know of many great musical acts who have passed us by. And I think that with this amphitheater, once it's up and running, once COVID restrictions have eased, it's going to bring kinds of musical acts and other performing arts. Councilor Nordak, I think it rose up on your screen. summer, maybe in July or so. Uh, the other thing I would say is that, you know, with 
I an anticipate this being an extremely popular venue. And we as a city will need to come up with a way to balance the needs between public access and private groups who want to access what I think is going to become one of the signature landmarks in Salem. So thank you so much. Thank you. Councilor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A month or so ago, the city council passed a resolution condemning institutional and systemic racism and pledging to do what we could to counteract its nefarious effects on the fabric of our society. Recent events in Atlanta highlight our need to condemn racism in all its aspects. The murder of Asian Americans is a predictable result of our country's sordid racial history. As a council, we should do all we can to ensure that Salem is anti-racist in words and deeds. There are secondary and tertiary concerns here. The first of these is our country's equally long history of institutional and systemic misogyny, which should also be equally condemned. The second of these concerns is the rather shockingly obvious fact that the white alleged killer of Asian American women was captured by law enforcement without injury, just as were many civilian white killers of people of color. The white men in Charleston, in Florida, in Georgia, and countless other cities. This is often in stark contrast to the violent treatment, including death, of people of color who are accused of crimes. Thankfully, this is not at all the case in Salem with our excellent police department and its individual officers. We should do all we can to maintain this high standard of equal treatment of all people in Salem. I know and I'm confident that we will. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Leung, you're with us. Would you like to speak? Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak um, briefly. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to do so. Um, so it's now it's been officially been one year since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our community has done what it has can do so far to stop the spread of COVID. And for that, I am thankful. As other counselors have mentioned so far today, a month ago, we have passed a resolution calling racism as a public health crisis. Last year, we initially had issued statements and we continue to do so calling about police brutality and being in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter. Now we're witnessing a rise in hate crimes against our Asian communities. There was a statement that was released through my nonprofit, the Micronesian Islander community, and I wanted to read a portion of it, which I think is important and relevant today. Now, as leaders, we're often sharing spaces resources, and intersectional experiences, especially with our Asian counterparts under the Asian and Pacific Islander community. And as such, as an elected leader, I myself express solidarity against the rise in the anti-Asian violence and hate, highlighted by the recent events that explicitly have targeted those in the Asian community. I am angry that these hateful acts are continuing to occur and are continuing to be perpetuated against our communities. We witnessed the racist and systematic crimes from the murders of eight women in Georgia to the increase of attacks and robberies against Asian elders. I demand that those perpetrators be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. These tragedies are a reminder that the fight is not over and we demand that the state of Oregon and the federal government formally declare that racism is a public health crisis. We do not condone these acts of violence. We do not condone racism. We stand in solidarity with the Asian community. Asian communities are continuing to face discrimination, increased hostility, and violence against them in the United States. We encourage everyone to be mindful to be supportive of each other and to stay well in this time of crisis. There's some information and resources that people could definitely reach out to. There's the Oregon Department of Justice and where they people could report hate crimes. There's also, of course, contacting the local police as well as the Salem Human Rights Commission. 
There's also some other resources, specifically Stop AAPI Hate at stopaapihate.org. And also understand that I understand that there's some solidarity action or calls to action, specifically from the White House, the memorandum condemning and combating racism, xenophobia, and intolerance against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the US. I hope that everyone who's joining us and watching us today, and as well as those who are present, you know, continue to support one another and to know that we're not alone, that we're in this together. Thank you. insight and your thoughts on this. Councilor Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Woody Mingis Shi, Jose Gonzalez, which means my name is in a Chinese traditional language. And I wanted to highlight this language because the people who use it are wanting us to hear their voices today. You know, I've spent time in Shanghai, China. And the main thing I wanted to share is no matter what you think of the government of China, and what it stands for, I, I've met the actual people that live there. And they're just like us. They're nice, hardworking, and just wanna provide for their family. You know, so luckily, I, I'm lucky that I'm able to base my opinion on reality and not what the news and others um, share. Um, thank you for that. There we go. I'm sorry. I'm with this thing, Councilor. We're not sure who you called on, Mr. Mayor. We couldn't hear you. Okay, just a sec. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, you. I called on you. Oh, great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, first, I just want to start by uh, thanking uh, Councilor DeYoung for her passion and her words and for coming here tonight to speak to us and to speak to the community. I very much appreciate them. I, and I join her and I, I'm very sad uh, for the recent events. Um, but I just I want to acknowledge her, her anger and her outrage and, and validate it. It's, it's um, not a good situation we're in right now in our, in our nation. I, I spoke a little bit ago about uh, at the Housing Authority meeting about uh, a grant where the Mid Willamette Valley Ho Housing Alliance has been notified of the intent to award uh, by the Oregon Housing and Community Services Department. And I, I now have the list of potential projects that would be funded should this uh, grant uh, come to fruition when it looks like it, it will be. So there's going to be uh, 11 new street outreach workers to engage 100 unaccompanied minors through home youth services. Um, there will be- At LSU, I think individually, you lined them up and you said, Our uh, I don't know what that was. Uh, there's an emergency, emergency shelter that'll um, allow three day centers in Salem, Silverton and Woodburn to provide services to an average of 80 people per day uh, that they, they don't currently uh, get to provide services to. Um, there's a, like an overnight shelter that would allow uh, folks uh, an increase in overnight shelters and there'll be a hotel and motel sheltering. Uh, the Center for Hope and Safety is gonna be uh, able to use some of the money for their work, a family promise, Sable House, uh, the winter duration sheltering uh, program will be upgraded and then modular sheltering as well. And then also a rapid rehousing program through uh, a variety of pr the programs I previously mentioned. So it's $5.5 million coming to our community uh, as it looks right now. And it's very exciting. It'll be, it'll, it will be a game changer for us. So just wanted to, there will be a press release coming out from the uh, Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance very soon to, to really provide the, all the details, but uh, that gives you kind of an idea of what's, what's headed our way. Great. It's just really good news, Councillor, and thank you again very much for your work on this as our chair. It's a lot of work and uh, for sure a lot of good stuff going on. So appreciate thank you. It's, a, it's been a really great opportunity. There's a, a great collaboration and coalition of folks from all over the Polk, Marion region that come together to work on it. So thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Councillor Stapleton. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I too wanted to acknowledge um, Councillor Leung and uh, just validate all that she said and her feelings and, and to let her know that I am with her as well. Um, I wanted to just give some stats that I um, had heard that were very shocking and, and also um, really great for me because it just kind of expanded my understanding of, of what this group of people is dealing with. So um, nationwide um, reports um, of hate against AAPI group um, have increased 149% over the last year. And uh, women are twice as likely um, to be at the end of that um, than men. So um, something obviously that I care deeply about. 68% um, are verbal attacks, 11 uh, are physical attacks, 20% are shunning, and 8.5 uh, are refusal of business and 6.5 are online harassment. Um, and, it, and it really breaks my heart that the West Coast has really been in the spotlight um, for different videos that have gone viral um, and, uh, you know, people spitting on, on people or coughing on people. It's just simply, um, it's just outraging. I, um, I also wanted to acknowledge our students at Willamette. Um, we've gotten an email, um, Councillor Anderson, and I, um, just a, their own fear right now is really, really heightened. And so um, I just wanted to, to call them out, let them know that um, we're thinking of you and we're, and we're trying to do all that we can. And we really condemn hate in all of its forms. And, um, and we see you and we understand your fear and, and it's um, real. And so we're doing all that we can here. And um, I also wanted to say that uh, we have a really great, a lot of really important things on the agenda. Um, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to let you know that I have planted about 50 milkweed plants for you. Um, I won't hand them all over to you, but I will donate them in your in your name to whoever wants them. Um, hand them over to hand them over to Peter Fernandez. He he actually spends his lunch hour planting milkweed here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much for um, taking the time for me. Great, thank you very much. And, uh, yes, Councillor Phillips. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I just really want to take the time to uh, echo everything else that my fellow councillors have said um, and really express a debt of gratitude um, for Councillor Leung sharing her lived experience with us and her leadership with us on this body. Um, I think her words are, are incredibly important for all of us to hear, and I definitely hear them. I, I, I think we all do. Um, you know, I don't think it's an accident that just a month ago uh, we adopted as part of the strategic plan that phrase that we are, as an organization, the city of Salem, anti-racist. So I'm sure that we are all listening and we're all trying to do our best to counteract that, that that's happening. Um, and I absolutely have heard the same data. It's been reported widely that Virginia uh, Stapleton, Councilor Stapleton just brought up. Um, and just, you know, to push back, it, it's nonsense to think that there's any correlation between um, you know, the Asian community and the virus. This is now a worldwide pandemic. The two are unrelated. Um, now, I do typically do a bit of a, a, an update regarding the pandemic and COVID-19. I do really want to thank Mayor Bennett for, you know, letting me share the, the mayor monthly video update um, with the community. I enjoyed being part of that process and having an opportunity to kind of let people know that um, we are making progress um, we really are on the other side of a mountain in terms of case cases happening per day. The winter surge is is dramatically like it's basically gone. We're not back to to normal yet, but um, we're back to kind of a steady state uh, of the uh, early fall. So we've really seen progress. Um, it was just really encouraging to see nationally and locally the number of vaccinations happening. Uh, it took us only 58 days as a country to achieve that 100 million vaccination effort uh, of injections. And it was the goal of doing 100 million in 100 days. So it was nearly half the time needed. So there really is success. The ability to do this ramp up of a vaccine distribution is going very well. Um, over a million people in Oregon have received at least one vaccine and over a half a million have received both doses. So it's, it's still pretty simple. You know, it's not over. We're not completely out of the woods. Uh, wear a mask when you're outside of your bubble, uh, social distance as per the guidelines, avoid large group gatherings, and when it's your turn, get a shot. There are three safe and effective vaccines um, that have been authorized for use in the United States. Um, you know, reach out to the Oregon Health Authority, like in a search engine on the website, or go to Salem Health, 
and more and more, you know, ask your local clinic or your local pharmacy. Um, with the, the newest vaccine, uh, the, it has some, you know, it's easier to store, doesn't require the cold storage. So it's going to be more widely available. So, you know, when it's your turn, get your shot. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I was uh, reading recently a report on who are the most ex effective spokesmen on encouraging people to get these shops, uh, shots. It's not politicians. It's not, you know, sort of the standard. It is a doctor uh, in their community, best their family doctor. And I think uh, since you're a doctor at the emergency room and sort of God forbid you're a doctor for all of us if we make it through the doors to your area of practice. So thank you for so strongly endorsing uh, getting vaccinated. It's really important. So thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Uh, where's Steve? Wonder if he can just sack. Steve Powers. I'm uh, I'm here, Mayor. Unfortunately, there's something now wrong with my video. Can people hear me? Yes, I've got your I've got your audio, so you've got my video. Very, very <laughs> We're doing good. real well down here. <laughs> I just wanted to highlight quickly for, for council, and I apologize if my face is taken over your screen, but I want to lean in so you can hear me. Uh, the tree report that's on the agenda is, is not uh, post ice storm. It is pre ice storm. Uh, so please uh, take it easy on our staff. Uh, we continue with the cleanup. We have eight to 10 crews out throughout the city. And we are also shifting now more resources into the parks and Pioneer Cemetery. Uh, we are continuing with the wood chip piles that have been extremely popular at Bush's Pasture Park and at the State Fairgrounds. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Powers? Nothing else, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead with some proclamations. We had uh, three of them arrive this week, this, um, this week first uh, uh, day of the month. Um, the first is Child Abuse Prevention Month proclamation. Uh, Kelly Perosa from Prevention Program Director at Liberty House is here to uh, accept the proclamation. Let me read it to you and then we'll hear from Kelly. Uh, Whereas every child deserves to live in a safe, loving, and caring family environment, and whereas in 2019, there were 13,674 reported victims of child abuse and neglect in Oregon. And of those reported cases, 1,238 were victims in Marion County. And whereas we stand together as individuals, organizations, and government agencies to commit to preventing child abuse in our county by raising awareness throughout the community and by educating and supporting caregivers, and whereas we assert uh, that strong families and safe, stable, and nurturing environments free from violence, abuse, and neglect are essential for children's optimal growth and success, which ensures a secure future for our communities where the needs of children are a priority and the needs of families are met. Now, therefore, I, Chuck Bennett, Mayor of the City of Salem, do hereby proclaim April 2021 Child Abuse Prevention Month and ask the community to observe this month with programs and activities that commit to protecting our children. Date is this 22nd day of March. And with that, I'd like to turn to Kelly. And if you have any thoughts, Kelly, you want to share any information, please do. And thank you for joining us to accept this. Well, that is my pleasure, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much. And I am representing, I know it's the Liberty House, I am representing the Marion County Child Abuse Prevention Month Committee. Ah, great. And it's an honor to be representing about 20 different organizations who serve children coming together every year to, uh, you know, collectively try to get things going in our community. And so especially thank you, City of Salem, who has uh, recently joined us. Um, I've been in conversations with Mayor Bennett, with Councilors Nordyke and Stapleton, and it's just been very powerful for me this year. I've been on the committee for six years to see 
that collaboration and action. So be sure to ask uh, Councillor Stapleton about Paint the Town Blue. I won't take all the time, but there's a car parade on April 2nd. We would love to see um, elected officials and just people who love Salem to participate in that. Um, but I also just kind of want to pause because we heard some startling statistics in that proclamation. I appreciate you putting them in there and reading that, but I want to leave you with one more. Most children don't tell anyone they are unsafe. Most children do not tell them, tell us that someone in their life is hurting them. We need to be their protectors. We need to be their responders. We need to be their healers we need to be the ones to give them a voice. So I thank you so much for claiming again, proclaiming again, uh, April being Child Abuse Prevention Month awareness in the city of Salem. And I, I call you to action. I challenge you to get involved somehow and, and take it to the next step. Get involved with Paint the Town Blue. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Kelly, and thank you for the tremendous work uh, you all are doing on the committee as well as, of course, family building blocks. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. This one is the um, Monarch Butterfly Pledge for those of you who have uh, been to these before, and I believe it's uh, being received by uh, the Byerleys, and I'm not sure if they're here. Yes, they, yes, they are. Ken's here. Okay, uh, whereas the monarch, monarch butterfly is one of the most iconic and studied butterflies in North America, wildly, widely, and probably wildly too, admired for its beauty, and whereas the monarch butterfly is extremely beneficial, pollinating many cultivated flowers and crops and serving as an indicator species for the ecological health of large geographic areas. And whereas the monarch butterfly's annual migration, which has been described as one of the most spectacular in the insect world, is now classified as a threatened phenomenon by inter the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And whereas the Western population of monarchs, which overwinter in California, has declined by more than 99% since the 1980s, from an estimated 4.5 million monarchs to less than 30,000 counted at overwintering sites in 2019. And whereas a major reason for the decline is the widespread loss of the milkweed plant, the only plant monarch butterflies lay their eggs on, as well as it being the monarch's primary larval food source. And whereas the entire community can play a critical role in providing habitat for monarchs and other pollinators by planting milkweed and nectar plants and reducing pesticide use. Now, therefore, I, Chuck Bennett, Mayor of the City of Salem, do hereby proclaim March 22nd, 2021, uh, that I will continue to participate in the Mayor's Monarch, Monarch Pledge. And through the signing of the National Wildlife Federation Mayor's Monarch Pledge, commit the City of Salem to voluntarily help restore habitat for the monarch and encourage all people of Salem to do the same. Sign Chuck Bennett, Mayor. Ms. Priley, do you wanna? Yes, on behalf of the Glen Gibson Creek Watershed Council, uh, we're very honored to uh, participate with the city of Salem. The city has been an incredible partner uh, in developing pollinator gardens in many of the parks in West Salem and uh, have been very cooperative in the development of an oak savanna on part a, a reservoir site that Peter didn't need, uh, but uh, has been a great opportunity to help both monarchs, but also all pollinators. And we really appreciate the willingness of the city to participate in a very constructive way and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ken. There's been, uh, uh, I noted a lot of plantings around uh, City Hall, the, the real change in plantings aimed at uh, uh, supporting this uh, international effort really to uh, restore the monarch to a, uh, uh, a more robust species than we're seeing with the th only 30,000 left, which I find just shocking figure, so. 
anyone else, and any of you, well, we do know Virginia has a lot of extra milk. <laughs> so, and we'd so be you, glad to put them out in the ground for you. <laughs> excellent. There's your, there's your man. Sounds All right. Great. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good. Okay. And then finally, it's Arbor Month. And uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that with whereas the city of Salem is one of only 17 cities in the country to have been a charter participant in the Tree City USA program since 1976 and the first city in Oregon to receive the Tree City USA 45th year award from the Arbor Day Foundation and whereas for the 45th consecutive year the city of Salem has met the requirements for the Tree City USA due to its urban forestry program supported by a minimum Minimum dollar per capita of public funds, tree ordinance, and formal Arbor Month activities. And whereas the city of Salem is also a sterling city with 15 Tree City USA growth awards in recognition of the city exceeding the goals established by the Arbor Day Foundation. Now, therefore, I, Chuck Bennett, Mayor of the City of Salem, do hereby proclaim April 2021 as Salem's Arbor Month and encourage all people to participate in community school and private observances uh, during, this, uh, during this Arbor Month. And uh, feel free to start replanting those trees you might have lost during that ice storm it's a it's a great time march is particularly a good time of year probably the last of the months this year to really get your your planting in in time so good luck okay thank you very much now we will move on We have no one uh, here to uh, provide public comment on any of the issues we're dealing with tonight, so we'll be moving right on through. Um, so it's a consent calendar first, Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move approval of the consent calendar with the exception of item 3.3B pulled by Councillor Anderson. Okay. Second. You wanna go, who, who's gonna? Second. Sec, second by Trevor Phillips, okay. All right, so we have item 3.1A, the March 8, 2021 draft city council minutes, item 3.1B, the March 15, 2021 draft joint city council and community engagement audit steering committee work session minutes. We have item 3.2A, library parkade policy for three hours of parking for library visitors, item 3.2B, uh, extension of emergency utility assistance and update on that on outreach and assistance provided to customers during the pandemic. Item 3.3A, First Amendment to the lease agreement between the City of Salem and Capital Community Television. Item 3.3C, recommended appointments and reappointments to the Citizens Advisory Traffic Commission, Salem Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Salem Planning Commission, Salem Public Art Commission, and Salem Public Library Advisory Board. And three, item 3.3D, the priority bills for the 2021 Oregon Legislative Session. Okay, great, thank you. Any discussion on any of the items? Okay, if the recorder would please call the roll. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councilor, I'm sorry, Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Stapleton? Aye. Councilor Anderson? Aye. Councilor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Leung, absent. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye, okay, those pass. Now we'll go to public hearings. Uh, start with uh, 21100. And I'm, who's, do we have a staff person who's going to take us through this? There we go. Hello, Glenn. Hello. You ready to go? Good. We have, do we have the city recorder first? Yes, I, I need to announce do. it. The city Council will conduct a public hearing concerning amending Salem Revised Code Chapter 601 floodplain overlay zone to approve Salem's rating within the Federal Emergency Management Agency's community rating system. The criteria is applicable to the proposed amendment are found in Salem Revised Code Section 110.085. 
testimony must be directed towards the identified criteria or other criteria the person believes to apply to the decision. The hearing will be conducted with the staff presentation first, followed by other interested persons. Neighborhood associations are limited to five minutes per association for testimony. Individuals testifying are limited to three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Glenn. Hey, good evening, Mayor Bennett and City Councilors. My name is Glenn Davis, and I'm the Chief Development Engineer and the Floodplain Administrator for the Public Works Department. Uh, in order to explain why we're proposing Ordinance Number uh, 121, I need to give some background about the floodplain management uh, program and the city and the community rating system. So, hold on. There. Um, so the federal government administers the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, and most cities and counties and tribes nation participate in this NFIP, uh, over 22,000 communities in all. Uh, and the federal government sets minimum standards that all communities need to meet, uh, and they cannot obtain federal loans or disaster funding or flood insurance unless they participate in the NFIP. And within the NFIP is a voluntary incentive program called the Community Rating System, or CRS. Uh, it's like an honors program within the NFIP. And those who participate are given credit points in, edit, in areas where community uh, exceeds minimum standards. So the incentive provided to a community comes through discounts to their flood insurance premiums. Uh, the better your score in the program, the higher your flood insurance discounts. So Salem first joined the CRS in 2008 as a class eight community. And the incentive then was a 10% reduction in all of Salem's flood insurance premiums. We've continued to improve through the years to a class five, noting that the class numbers get lower as your scores get better. Uh, class five is a 25% discount. It's the highest CRS score in Oregon. And we share that score with a few other cities. So the way that a community improves its score is to accrue a cumulative point total based on a scoring system established by FEMA. And points are available as an incentive uh, from a, a wide array of floodplain management activities, uh, include public information programs and stormwater facility maintenance and floodplain management planning and a variety of other uh, options. And uh, in addition to this cumulative point scoring, uh, there are specific classes that have mandatory prerequisites. And uh, those are class six and four and one. So uh, regardless of your point total, you cannot reach class six or four or one unless you meet every prerequisite for that class. And that class four limitation has limited uh, Salem for the past few years, because we already reached the 3,000 points we needed in our last audit by FEMA, but we had not yet met all four, uh, the class four prerequisites. So tonight's ordinance is our last step in meeting all of those class four prerequisites. So anyone paying flood insurance premiums in Salem should see additional discounts on their flood insurance within a year or so uh, once this is passed. Great. So another significant implication of meeting the class four prerequisites is it opens the door for us to search for more points to improve to class three. And staff has a goal of reaching that class three level within the next couple of years. And if we're successful, then flood insurance discounts will increase to 35%. Uh, and some have asked if all this effort is worth the trouble. Uh, I just wanted to add that as a class four community, Salem residents will save a total of about $386,000 per year or $397 per flood insurance policy. And if we're successful in improving to class three, that would improve, increase the savings to $450,000 per year or $463 per policy. So not only are the benefits significant, but the costs to the community are actually quite small. I've led this program for about 15 years, and it's a small part of what I do. Uh, Robin Dahlke is another floodplain manager who assists in the program. So between the two of us, we have less than one full-time equivalent employee. So this program is mostly all positives with very few negatives. And then one last comment about the CRS program is uh, there are 22,000 communities that participate in the NFIP, and if we reach class three, we will be among the top 12, ranked among 22,000 in the nation. So Salem has a top-notch floodplain management program, not just because of one or two people, but they have dozens of people uh, on city staff who do great work every day. And we also have a council, this council and previous councils, 
who have given bipartisan support to good floodplain management. So the CRS program is, is why we are proposing ordinance number 121. So very, very good, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Glenn? We don't have, as I said before, we don't have any public signed up on this. So any questions? Okay, Councillor Hoy, do you have a motion? I believe that we're gonna do that under number seven, aren't we, or am I mistaken? I guess, it says here, advance to second reading for enactment is what I'm, what my note tells me. So, so uh, Mr. Mayor and, and Council President Hoy, yeah, it, it does appear as an ordinance, so, um, you can, you can uh, take the council or the staff recommendation right now just to advance it and you'll conduct second reading later on at the agenda. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I apologize. I move we accept staff recommendation and advance uh, to second reading for enactment. Okay. Thank you. Second. Second. Second by Stapleton. Okay. Any, any discussion? No. Okay, would you call the roll then? Councillor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Councillor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Leung, absent. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay, uh, motion passes. And then uh, 4B, Ruthie, do you wanna take us into that one? City Council will now conduct a public hearing to consider resolution number 2021-9 to amend the Trailstead Reimbursement District by lowering the district fees based on actual construction costs. Individuals testifying must provide their name and address or ward. Individuals are limited to three minutes of testimony. Thank you. Again, we have no public testimony, uh, but we do have a staff report. Okay. Am I visible? Yes, you are. Okay, sorry for the delay. Um, good evening again. I'm also Glenn Davis. Um, I'm still the Chief Development Engineer in the Public Department. And uh, Resolution 21-9 um, uh, uh, is simply reducing the reimbursement fee for the Trailstead Reimbursement District. But before discussing those details, I want to give a brief introduction into developer financed city infrastructure. So um, the most common source of infrastructure financing by developers is system development charges or STCs. Uh, these funds are limited to five types of infrastructure, parks, transportation, water, wastewater, and stormwater. STCs are collected when development permits are issued one building at a time, and then those combined resources are pooled to build large infrastructure projects. So as a simple illustration, parks STCs today are $4,375 for a single family home. After 100 homes are built, then the city has $437,500 to spend on parks infrastructure needed to serve those new developments. So next, I'll briefly explain some background about the SDC methodology and introduce the purpose for reimbursement districts. So we use our infrastructure master plans to calculate growth costs and growth units in order to determine our cost per unit of growth that we charge as an SDC. This is the same kind of calculation we use for reimbursement districts as well. So to use stormwater as an example, the growth costs are stormwater facility costs and the growth units are impervious surfaces. So the cost per unit of growth for the SDC is based on the growth costs of stormwater projects citywide divided by the growth units, which is the total square footage of new impervious surface yet to be constructed citywide. So the SDC amount charged to each development project is that cost per unit of growth. So by state law, 
SDCs can be used only for capital projects that add capacity to grow, not fixing existing deficiencies. So it's common that capital projects are partially eligible for SDCs and require other funding. So developers will, will often be required to build facilities larger than is needed for their developments. And these developers pay up front to build the facilities as part of their development projects. And they get reimbursed by SDCs after their costs are certified, but only for a portion of the cost offering. So when these capital projects are partially eligible for reimbursement, then reimbursement districts are a good source for additional funding. And lastly, SDC fee amounts are uniform citywide. And this is significant because infrastructure costs can vary uh, depending on where you are in, the, in town. And this cost variability can often cause financial shortages that uh, can be augmented with reimbursement district fees. So the reimbursement districts are one resource to help address some of these financial uh, shortages. Uh, and a common use of reimbursement districts occurs when a developer builds a major project, it's partially eligible for SDCs, and that unreimbursed portion of the cost can be distributed uh, among all properties that, that benefit from improvement. And like SDCs, reimbursement fees are collected only when a property develops and generates those growth units. So it's not like a tax or a lien, it's only charged uh, to, to the neighbors when it is uh, a development project. So now to our matter at hand in amending this reimbursement district. Uh, this district re relates to street improvements constructed at the intersection of Charleston 36, shown in red on the screen. And those were required uh, for the Oregon State Police facility. This is at the northeast quadrant of the intersection of I-5 and Cooper. So here is the intersection before that state police facility. And then shown in white are the changes that were made to the intersection. I don't think we have that up yet, do we? Uh, the changes for the police facility, this is the new curvature, and this is actually a current map showing those changes. So the um, those changes have, were made uh, to that road, uh, and that's the cur current uh, aerial photo. So uh, to explain the change in the reimbursement fee, uh, I'll go back, because this, this district was adopted before those improvements were made. And so now we have actual costs, I'm gonna go through and explain that, uh, and I'll use that same equation we used to describe SDC. So first we'll talk about growth units in the district. So the district boundary was adopted in the original district. I didn't the get it. Screen, and those boundaries are uh, Interstate 5, uh, and railroad tracks on the east, and oh, people on the south. So that's the current district. That line, it just pops up. That's unchanged. Uh, and our traffic engineering staff recommended that there are 9,352 vehicle trips generated within that district, and that is unchanged. So for the unreimbursed costs, I'm gonna point out that only a small portion of the improvement is SDC eligible because the new turn lanes add capacity, but the reconfiguration of the intersection uh, is not eligible. So initially, the, un the estimated costs were $502,674. And now, after the uh, cost was certified, that, uh, that amount dropped significantly to $285,731 in unreimbursed costs. So showing that in our equation, uh, we see the unreimbursed costs were reduced. And then dividing that by uh, the unreimbursed cost by growth units, the reimbursement district fee has been reduced from $53.76 to $30.55. Uh, and those are uh, to be paid with which each, each development and those who have already paid would see a re refund in their overpayment. So okay. the conclusion staff recommends the resolution. Okay, Councilor Hoy. Yes. Do you want to move staff recommend? Yeah, did you want to stop sharing your screen, Mr. Davis, please? Thank you. Uh, I move uh, City Council adopt resolution number 2021-9, approving the adjustment of the Trollstad reimbursement district fee to reflect actual construction costs after conducting a public hearing on the matter. Second. Second. Who seconded first? I, I do as the former chair of the SDC. Oh, okay, okay, I yeah, it's your there. turn. It was Sorry. Phillips. 
Anderson seconded it. I'll let Anderson go. It's my war. I'll let Anderson Thank you. Go he, he was not going to be a happy camper if you didn't let him go on that one. Okay. Do you want to talk about it at all, Chris? Well, I just have one comment, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I, I, I had a conversation with Councillor Phillips yesterday regarding reimbursement districts, and I just want to apologize because uh, I went into a lot more detail than Mr. Davis did, and I went and I had several more graphs, and I apologize that I didn't just breeze through it like Mr. Davis did. So anyway, I apologize, Mr. Phillips. Okay. Any Anyone else? Okay. Um, please call the roll. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Councillor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Young, absent. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Now, special orders of business. I, all I have right now is 3.3B, Councillor Anderson, is that the one you pulled? Yes, it is, Mr. Mayor. I move the staff recommendation on the purchase and sale agreement for the property uh, located at 1370 Wallace Road Northwest. Second. Second. Second by Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I pulled this after I looked at it a bit because this relates to um, <laughs> An issue that has been before the council for a long time. I think uh, Councillor Lewis and I are the ones who, uh, as well as you, Mr. Mayor, are the ones who have been here from the beginning. And the issue is, what do we do with Marine Drive at the south end? Do we run it down Fifth Avenue or Fifth Street? I'm not sure, Fifth Avenue or Fifth Street, which is pretty much north-south, or do we curve it over to the, to the east and go between the Pioneer Village there and the park? Yeah. And um, um, uh, the council direction has been to use some money left over from the 2008 bond to acquire the right of way north of where Fifth Street comes in, okay. uh, would come in. And if you look at this one, uh, it acquires that, but it also swings uh, out just a little bit to the east on that property where potentially it could end up. Uh, ending up on the uh, on the other side of Pioneer Village in between the park, and I don't object to buying the part that goes to um, uh, 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 to Fifth Avenue, and we're only talking about sixty thousand dollars here, so it's not that we're spending a whole lot of money. I just want to say that if if some if the staff comes back at some later point and says let's continue uh, buying right away uh, to the right hand side of this, that is to set uh, Marine Drive going east and then going south um, um, to the east of Pioneer Village and coming into Cameo Street. I, I will not be in favor of that, but I'm certainly in favor of, of this purchase because it does come start the right of way as it goes north from Fifth Avenue where it intersects to the property. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lewis. Yes, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll support the motion. Anything that will bring Marine Drive and the 30 years that we've been working on it to fruition is something that I should be supporting. I, I animately uh, disagree with Council Anderson, and I've mentioned this before, um, even the day where Councillor Kayser uh, proposed this. If the City Council truly wants to address Marine Drive, then do it through the transportation plan. But as it exists right now, Marine Drive starts at Glen Creek and moves north. Okay, very good. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, Ruthie, would you call the roll? Councillor Anderson? Aye. Councillor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Leung, absent. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Okay, we'll, I don't have any other special orders. We'll go to information. Oh, Mr. Mayor, I apologize. We have item 5A that was an addition. 5A. It's the amendment to the emergency dec declaration. Right, okay. You want to go ahead and move that? 
Yes, I move City Council adopt resolution number 2021-11 to amend the declaration of emergency extended by resolution number 2020-49 related to unsheltered residents. Second. Second by? Nordyke. Nordyke, thank you. We have some questions. I believe maybe the city attorney or the city manager would like to maybe make a few comments first and then. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, One of you. Th thank you, Council. This this matter is before you, and I th and thank you for adding it to the agenda uh, as a late addition. Uh, we continue to search for suitable sites to help our unhoused neighbors. Uh, the Portland Road site has been identified as a feasible location for vehicle camping as well as uh, shelter camping. As you might recall, uh, through the money that was authorized by, by City Council earlier this year, we have purchased 20 what are known as, as pallet shelters. Uh, we believe the Portland Road site might be, is very likely a, a, a suitable site for use of those shelters, uh, secure tents uh, that will provide a, a dry, uh, secure, a place for for people. Uh, Gretchen Bennett is on the call, and she can go into more more detail. Uh, City Attorney Atchison can explain uh, the mechanics of of why uh, this is before you in the form that it is. Uh, the bottom line, the, the 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 summary is it's it's a step that we're recommending in our ongoing efforts to uh, locate and site. Uh, additional shelter for our uh, unsheltered neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure which of the two of you, uh, Mr. Atchison, do you have anything you need to say on this? Mr. Mayor, I don't have anything prepared, but if there's questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, if there's any questions, right. Uh, Gretchen, do you want to speak also, to this at all? Well, Same happy to welcome questions, you bet. Okay. Well, we got three people ready to take questions. Anyone have any questions for them? Who, let me see, any hands again? Ah, there we go, Councilor Nordyke. Thank you. Uh, Gretchen, can you tell us a little bit about the staffing and security that would be provided if this resolution were to pass for a temporary shelter at Portland Road? You know what, that would actually be um, something I'd want to be able to come back and report on more completely. This was a very, um, we've been continuing to look for locations. Um, all the while we had anticipated this purpose at Portland Road many months ago, back when we entered into an agreement with a community action agency. And so our still in our feasibility stage, and in the discussion stage of, you know, will it be feasible? Is council interested? You know, and then we would want to clarify those details. I am expecting and my understanding based on the um, operation that is most similar and recently that there would be 24 seven staff as well as 24 seven security on site. That's my understanding and expectation, but we're not that far along yet in, in the discussions. Um, this. This um, has been a very emergent conversation. Okay, Councilor thank Hoy. you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, oh, Councillor no. Nordyke. That's okay. all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Hoy. Thank you. I was just going to comment that in conversation with uh, staff from Church of the Park last week, uh, Ms. Rutherford and Councillor Anderson and I toured the, the pavilion, the operation at the fairgrounds, and they indicated that they would be operating it in a similar fashion. Of course, there are differences because of the physical location, but in a similar nature to what they're doing currently. So I was very comfortable with that. Yeah, I was out there, uh, out to the fairgrounds today with the county commissioners, and we had a similar conversation with uh, um, the Church of the Park folks. Uh, it sounded like, too, they, they're working on figuring out how to kind of recreate the restroom shower facilities with some uh, more mobile units and how those would be uh, handled, I think, will be really interesting. That uh, 
but they seem to be committed to using the model they're using out at uh, the fairgrounds, which certainly has been a, a tremendous, tremendous success. So, uh, it's good. Craig, there's still work underway to clarify those pieces as well as continue discussions with the neighbors, you know, on their right. preferences and thoughts about how would operations work. Oh, Councilor Ga Gonzalez, yeah. sorry. Yeah, Councilor Gonzalez may have some thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. You know, yeah, that the members from the Northgate Neighborhood Association, you know, they are concerned for two reasons. One is the actual change. Some really haven't been um, in the loop for several for these several months, so they think it's something new. Um, but the other one is really just to be kept in the loop. We had our last uh, neighborhood association meeting a few days ago, Thursday. You know, um, we're just starting to grow that neighborhood association, the chair. They're really doing a good job of doing outreach. And it's these kind of actions that cause them sometimes to give up and not attend. Um, you know, and I, I did tour the fairgrounds site also. And inside, well managed. I mean, it's um, very well organized. And I'm hoping that it's giving um, um, our neighbors in, that are living inside there a little bit of hope. Um, but, you know, this isn't a prison, so these people can come and go. And the right. one thing that they hadn't really thought too much about was the impact on the local neighborhood, specifically the paths that these people have to use to access our city, you know, which um, could be uh, stores, convenience stores, and uh, bus stops, for example. You know, I tend to support this motion, but because, you know, once the fairground site is closed, I mean, we do need some more options. Um, but if anything, the only, the other last uh, comment I wanted to raise from uh, my neighbors is, you know, they're really trying to ask the operators to prioritize the most vulnerable uh, yeah. families, women, and uh, people with kids, you know, so that's really one of the things they did want me to share. Okay, great. All right, anyone else? Yes, Councilor Nordyke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Gonzalez, I appreciate your concerns and I appreciate the fact that you, like many of us, have toured the shelter. I went to the fairground shelter unannounced a couple of times just to see how things were going when they weren't expecting uh, any of us or any other elected official present. Every time I went, it was spotless. Every time I yeah. went, it was well managed. Every time I went, there were people who are coming and going to their jobs, coming and going to medical appointments. There are several people who, according to the Church of the Park, transitioned out of that shelter into permanent housing. That's right. We all know that temporary shelter is not a long-term solution. I know that a street corner is not a home. I know that a tent is not a home. We, we are, as you know, simultaneously pursuing long-term solutions like Sequoia Crossings, like we voted earlier tonight, and I also know from visiting and talking with the unsheltered by myself on my own, no hand holders, no filters, that this is, a, this is really helping people. And I would encourage the, uh, the Northgate Neighborhood Association to consider checking out the facility or actually go down to the fairgrounds right now and see for themselves how well run that facility is. And I think that might perhaps alleviate some of the concerns that they have. Their concerns are well taken. I appreciate you bringing them forward. But I, we already have some success stories coming out of this other shelter. So that gives me hope that we can do it again. And again, save people and bring them in from out of a very cold spring. So I'll be voting in favor. But thank you so much for bringing the concerns forward from your neighborhoods. Yeah, what I what I heard today and, and have the, the other time I've been out there uh, really is that uh, if you have the level of management, uh, and that's what appears to be moving along with the, the understanding of these kinds of larger homeless uh, uh, projects, if you have the kind of case management, case assistance, all of the services, uh, they really are a success moving people back into housing. I mean, that's really what they're up to. So I think uh, I think as the, the neighborhood gets a, an understanding of what's going on out there, gets a chance, I hope we can uh, get some folks out to Northgate who are actually experiencing it to share and to answer those kind of questions, because that's exactly, I think, what every neighborhood that is looked at for this kind of program has that reaction. You know, is it managed? Is it going to be a, a blight in the neighborhood? And I think uh, uh, so far we've had real success out there, I think. But it's 
got to have that level of management and support. It just it just has to. It can't be a uh, like like we've got in those two parks. We cannot have that start up again. That is so totally out of control uh, because we just didn't set it up as a managed uh, a managed situation. I think that may be one of our next projects is to look at how to how to retrieve. Uh, what we've got over in those two parks or something uh, to, to get a handle on this thing. And even then, all we'll have is a handle on it. There's so many so many needs out there, and they're so different. Uh, uh, Virginia? Okay. Virginia? Thank you, thank you Mr. Mayor. Um, I just had a question for Ms. Bennett. Um, how has the communication been with the different neighborhood associations in the area? I know you and I have been on lots of phone calls with them, and and I know that we have a really great uh, binder of lessons learned um, as we've grown. Um, has it been going well? And and have are they, um, uh, you know, getting their their questions answered? Well, I would say in this situation, I wish I had been at the meeting on Thursday night. I'm generally aiming for that and have had several conversations and and set up some special meetings with just that intent. However, honestly, I had been under the understanding that the ability to do this work had already been approved and discussed back in the fall and would be just kind of, we, we, we were already implementing it. And literally, and that's why it was such a last minute question, even to you, is, is I had already thought that was a, a feasible and, and approved use early on. And then when we realized we do have a question for council, I'm kind of still in my feasibility approach, which is, is it even legal? Is the property owner even interested? Is it a wetland or not? And then I begin the conversation about, okay, so now operationally, what, what are we thinking? Who would be there? What are the access points, et cetera? So I, it all came very quickly together, <laughs> but I wish I'd, I was, and I was literally still working on other locations, you know, last Thursday and Friday as well. And so I, uh, I look forward to continued discussions with the team and I wish I'd been at the meeting Thursday night and yeah. hope we can set something up soon to keep talking. Mayor, yeah, one more I, comment. I, I completely trust that you're working hard on all of these different fronts. And I just bring that up because I know um, Councilor Gonzalez and I have just been, that has been the one concern from our neighborhood associations. Yeah. And it's not that they're against it. They just need the communication to know what's coming um, so that they can be prepared um, or get their their questions answered in a timely way. And and I'm with you. I, I thought we were, you know, going down one path with that place. And so this was a new kind of uh, thing for me to kind of readjust. I'm very excited for it. I think it's going to be, um, like everybody else has said, really a, a success. So um, just want to bring that that forward and make sure the communication is, is going well. Thank you. Councillor Gonzalez, did you have something? Yeah, I just want to, I guess, maybe connect a few dots. I think... Um, Specifically with regards to this, the, the state, we're talking about two different things, right? But there's a third thing that we're not talking about. And I think this is where um, people, I think, are, are, are not connecting the final dot. And for example, when, I, when I'm driving around between my house, my, my, my business here on Fairgrounds Road, visiting family, I'm getting on and off on Market Street, Yeah. right? I'm driving by um, uh, Salem Parkway. You know, um, now there's, you know, the state fairgrounds and then maybe Portland Road and then um, North Portland Road, which is um, close to the Kale Street. Uh, it's literally now the other day I drove around. I said, I'm going to I see what I'm seeing, but maybe I'm going to I'm going to try a different route. So I got off on Kubler Mission Street going south. I drove around on commercial, went down to Skyline. You know, I saw no homeless uh, activity. Right. You know, so that's the that's the disconnect. I think that most people aren't. Are, I think I, I'd want everybody to make that connection. That it's just not one place. It's just this constant concentration around a specific area, and we're seeing it um, on a consistent basis, um, not just uh, from one place. I mean, Church of the Park. Like I said, I was impressed. I left uh, feeling um, sad because you know the situation these people are in but I really felt hopeful. But I think that's where the neighborhood association, that's the conversations. Most of them want to help these people, but it's just, it's everything else adding up. So that's, a, yeah. that's the last thing I wanted to share. Yeah, 
it's, it's a really good question. I think uh, it's a mix of all kinds of things, but one of them I hope we all keep in mind when we go by Market Street and the bridges where there's people living under them or out on the parkway, that's what a homeless program by the state of Oregon looks like. And we're not going to keep allow ours to stay looking like we're going to fix that. I don't know if the state of Oregon will. They've got bills that will make it worse. So those are kind of things I think we need to really keep track of. Uh, that's the program they're talking about, unfortunately, because it is it does does homeless people have just no good uh, in terms of moving them along a continuum toward uh, some sort of uh, reemergence in the in the uh, uh, larger community. So it's really too bad. Yeah, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I agree with these comments about from uh, Councillor Stapleton and Councillor Gonzalez, and it seems to me that there are some wards that are much more affected by this than other wards. And I would include in that uh, Councillor Gonzalez's Ward 5, Councillor Stapleton's Ward 1, and uh, my Ward 2, which is where Cascade Gateway Parks is. So um, those are the wards we really have to look at. And um, it would be great to have a greater dispersal area of these yeah. folks who do need help. And, uh, and I would hope that uh, Gretchen uh, Bennett and the city manager would look at that, keep that in mind um, when they are looking for uh, uh, other places to um, help our uh, neighbors who yep. are don't have shelter. Right, Councilor Hoy. And maybe, I don't know, Oops, Councilor Hoy is raising his hand here, maybe it's Ward 6 too, but, but those are the, it's more the inner wards that are, that uh, have concern about that than the, than the outer wards. Uh, I'm sorry, I completely disagree. Yeah, I think. With that statement, and I just wanna, I don't think that this is a productive conversation. Yeah. I think that there's homelessness in every, every community, in every part of every community. It's a varying degrees, but we're all impacted by it and we ought to be focusing on some solutions. And I, I guess I'm confused on what we're, we're talking about. Oh, my word has it and these words don't, yeah. but um, we're all impacted by a significant degree. And the, really the folks who are, who are homeless are the people who are really impacted. They're the ones living on the street and we need to be focusing on, on some solutions to that. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Jim? Uh, I just, I, I wanna talk a minute about the takeaway that I left the uh, pavilion with when I visited there. And that um, was truly the success of it. And when we were talking to the folks that were running it, um, the question came up, what do we need to address the homeless issue? And they uh, were clear, we need about 40 of these places. Exactly. If we really are going to address the issue and be successful, we need 40 of them. Even though it may take one at a time, we need to recognize that it's gonna take a lot of strength from this council to get more of them throughout the city. And we need to be focused on that. Okay. Yes, Councillor Trevor. Um, I, I I think this is a good conversation, but we may be straying a little bit from from the topic. I just want to say that um, I attended the same thing that Councillor Lewis did with you, Mayor Chuck Bennett, and and Councillor Gonzalez. And I think what they were saying is you need to have forty campsites to make the the, the site feasible and pencil out in terms of you know having you know what is it the. Uh, uh, I can't think of it, um, but you get enough people together that you can actually staff it. Um, yeah. And I think that what they were saying is they'd like to see two or three like in the next year and then move eventually to five. I don't remember hearing them say that they wanted to move to 40. So I think it's 40 campsites um, in a managed site uh, at a maximum. Yeah, okay. Anything else under uh, information reports anyone wants to check in out? Councillor Anderson. Thank you, yeah. Uh, Councillor Hoy makes makes good points, and I didn't mean to say that the wards that I picked out are the ones that are getting, um, I'll just put quotes around it, stuck with the problem. It's our city's problem, and we all ought to take care of it, uh, yeah. wherever that is. Yeah, I know I get email from people uh, who are out in the Kubler Road area asking about what is that mess on Market Street all about. So it's, it's a citywide, uh, I think everyone in town feels the pressure of this. And Mr. Mayor, just a reminder, we're still under five, so we need to vote on this. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, are we? 
We're not to information reports yet. We're still on 5A. We voted on it, didn't we? No. Okay, we'll vote again. Ruthie, <laughs> did you have a... <laughs> No, we, didn't vote. we voted on the uh, the uh, measure that God. Anderson. I, I appreciate all this help. Let's go on. Let's finish this information <laughs> report thing. I thought we had voted, and it did pass, Councillor. We did not. I'm sorry, no. Mr. Mayor. We have not voted on this, and it didn't pass yet. It will, I'm sure, but it hasn't. We voted on my poll, which we we looked at before. My poll on uh, on uh, Marine Drive right away. We haven't okay, voted so, on the emergency uh, office. Ruthie, do we need to? We, do we need to vote on this? Yes, we need to vote on 5A. Okay. Councillor Phillips? Y yes. Councillor Leung, absent. Councillor Gonzalez? Yes. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye, okay. Now information reports. By the way, at some point, I hope if we're gonna have stuff come flying onto the agenda, we'll get a clearer picture of where this stuff is. I, I really didn't have it showing up anywhere on mine, so it'd be helpful. Okay, anything on information reports? Councilor Stapleton. Yeah, I would love to hear from our city forester on the uh, Salem 2020 annual tree report. Is he on the line? No, but Patricia is. Mayor, I don't know if uh, Mylan is on, but Patricia Farrell is here and can, and can provide uh, a quick overview. Okay. Great. Uh, yes, good evening, Patricia Farrell. Um, not the urban forester, but Parks and Natural Resources Planner. Um, yes, yeah, so the 2020 annual tree report, I mean, I feel like it's a little bit out of date now after we had that big ice storm. Um, but it was uh, for the last few years, we've been uh, pulling together all the different information that we have for our different tree planting projects, um, just to try to consolidate them in one sort of calendar year um, report for council to look at so you can get a, a sense of the type of work, the number of trees that are getting planted every year for through our various contracts and also through um, our urban forester, um, urban forestry section. So um, yeah, it's a little bit out of date because it is already, you know, March and it did end in December. But, but um, as you can see, we planted hundreds of trees. Um, we've increased the number that we've planted this year, and the urban forestry section is doing a great work with the tree inventory um, and also with outreach. We had kind of a rough year because of the pandemic, so we were really happy that we were able to get as many trees planted as we did. Okay. Virginia, thank anything? You. Yeah, thank you so much. I just had a, a couple of questions. Um, I did um, see that there were different types of um, programs that you use, um, I'm, is it wrap it on or, or something like that? I was wondering, maybe I can just email him separately or you and, and figure out um, what those were, but also just seeing all the different ways that you're trying to increase um, tree canopy and some really fun options and, and great ones that maybe haven't been started yet. Um, and I was um, also wondering if you have thought about at all adding a, a kind of rebate for folks who are able to plant trees on private property. I didn't see any kind of program for people planting on private property on, on the list of things to do. Is that something that we could maybe look into? Yes, actually, we are looking into that. We're going to start um, with a tree survey um, going out to uh, people in the city to ask about what would it take for them to to plant trees on their own property? You know, what are the incentives that would motivate them or what are the things that um, are barriers to them planting trees? Because we know that if we ever really wanna keep increasing our tree canopy, we need to have private property involved. So we are definitely looking at that. Or, and, and rebates are one idea or um, discounted trees or, you know, free, free planting. I mean, things like that. We're kind of looking at all those different options. That's great, thank you. I did see another fun one on there where you wanted the, uh, the idea is that the neighborhood associations would compete for a tree canopy. And I thought that was hilarious and fun. And I thought if they're not up for it, maybe my fellow counselors are up for it and we can just kind of uh, do something fun here, so. 
<laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you for the report. It was great. Okay. Any anyone else on uh, an information report? Yeah, Jim. Well, uh, I'm going to bring this up, um, but I hope I don't step in it. I, I was talking to someone the other day about some programs that they have in cities like Seattle and in Boston, where they're actually planting fruit trees in the inner city. And I was I was impressed. I mean, it made sense to me. Uh, you know, I don't know about the idea of walking down the street and having all the rotten apples on the sidewalk, but I like the idea of walking down the street and picking an apple off a tree. So I'm just curious if there's any any feasibility of doing something like that or not. You know, that idea comes up a lot um, because people are interested in having more food available. And so we're looking at that more in community gardens. Um, the issue with doing it as street trees is, as you mentioned, they can be messy. Um, they then attract wildlife that then get hit by cars. Um, and so it, street trees are not necessarily the best place to have fruit trees, but community gardens are. The, the issue there is just making sure that we have um, a really dedicated crew of people to take care of them because they are, they do take more management for pruning and sometimes spraying. Sometimes you have to, you know, take care of, of insects or you go organic and go that way. But either way, you're going to have fallen fruit. Um, who's going to collect it? Can we take it to the food bank? So there's a lot of issues and questions to, um, before we start doing that. <laughs> Anyone else on any of the other information reports? Okay. Okay, we'll go to first readings. An ordinance relating to wastewater pretreatment amending SRC 74.030050417. Four five five and five zero zero. Okay. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move City Council conduct first reading of Ordinance Bill two twenty one, adopting wastewater industrial pretreatment regulations, and scheduling a second reading of the ordinance. Second. Second by Lewis. Any discussion? Okay, Ruthie. Call the roll. Councilor Leung, absent. Councilor Gonzalez? Yes. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councilor Stapleton? Aye. Councilor Anderson? Aye. Councilor Phillips? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay. And now, uh, Second reading. An ordinance relating to stormwater and floodplain overlay zone amending SRC 601.075. Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councilor Stapleton? Aye. Councilor Anderson? Aye. Councilor Phillips? Aye. Councilor Young, absent. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay, motion passes. I don't see anything further on the agenda, so we are adjourned. <laughs>